the gas town scheme clock has is owned by the city and it says on the base live steam winds the weights. Live steam does not wind the weights in 25 years. Um, to me it's offensive and it's offensive that nobody from the heritage society is complaining about fake heritage. It's the most photographed object in Vancouver, my story. Who believe the, the plaque which is put there by the city. Yeah. I mean, I have a question for you because it's kind of like uh, the Terry Fox Memorial, right? So if we do fake heritage for 10 years, does fake heritage become heritage because it was actually a cultural practice that we adopted? <coughs> well, I mean, we shouldn't do it anymore. And I, I mean, I think Gaston's a great example of that in that the whole public realm scheme there in terms of the, you know, the pavers, the brick, the, the nine ball lamp standards, those were put in in the 70s as replicas of some, well, except for the brick sidewalks. I don't know if they had those back in 1900. No. But um, some of it's replica, replication of a beautification scheme from the 70s. And I actually think that's part of its value today, is that that happened in the 70s. And that was part of saving Gastown and tells the story of how the community engaged and the city participated in celebrating what Gastown was. The steam clock, I think, is part of that story. Um, I don't know the specific wording on it and what it's saying, but uh, you know, I think we have to be careful about fake heritage, and I think that's a very good point, though, to also um, pretend something is what it's not. I mean, you see, you do see that, uh, and, and that's where also people just build replicas and say, well, that's good enough, and you know, there's probably some place for when that happens and, and that makes sense, um, but it needs to be honest that it's a replica, that it's not actually an authentic thing. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> Very good question. Yeah, we are having that struggle in Queen's Park as well that, um, you know, what seem currently to, to be of importance and, and to, to, how do I frame this? So um, there, there's kind of a, a question about new development and what new development in that neighborhood is going to look like. And a lot of folks feel um, that new, what's new and in going into that neighborhood needs to be sympathetic, which is true, but also that um, that there isn't as much room for contemporary expression. And so that's really, you know, at what point do you um, allow things to continue to grow and, and continue to become, like maybe it's something that happened in time that we weren't particularly happy with at that time, but what does that mean for us in 20 years from now or in 30 years from now or in 50 years from now? Right, so um, I think that's a very valid question. Uh, we don't, we shouldn't <laughs> build historic architecture now. Uh, I, I, the you can't. It, it's a different expression of technology, of economics, of materials, of you name it. It just we don't build Queen Anne buildings for a very good reason. We shouldn't, and if we do build them, we build them out of hardy plank and vinyl windows. So. It's not good, it's just not good. Um, so the standards and guidelines don't push us in that direction, we don't push in that direction. Surprisingly, the public often pushes in that direction and that's the challenge is a lot of people are much, much more comfortable being safe about it. Like, just make it look old, it'll be okay. Just, just make it fit in, just make it look old. And, and that's a surprisingly common um, um, perception. And if I could jump in on that as well, I think someone mentioned it earlier, but about if we're going to continue to replicate and make this fake heritage for the next 25 years and it becomes the symbol of our generation, and you know, I'm sitting here in another 30 years looking back and being like, oh yeah, we did do that in the early 2010s. Like we all built craft and style houses. What does that say? I guess you we'll know, have to keep an buy. example yeah. designated. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Uh, so the question related to um, time, you mentioned that you have a house now from the 80s that is going to be on the, or is or is going to We're be gonna on We're going to recommend it. Yes. Um, yeah. So the heritage to someone like myself who's relatively uneducated on this topic, there it implies some duration of time that something has been valued um, as part of the city, as an important part of the city or country or, or whatever. So just how, how do you go about thinking about how long is enough how long does something need to be uh, a valuable part of the city to be deemed heritage? And um, if you could maybe just talk about kind of that, that decision. Sure. 
I have a quick thought about that one. Um, I work a lot with young people, so um, everywhere from elementary school age through high school, and this is my pitch as to why you get young students on board. Um, I think, you know, if you have someone, um, like one of my students the other day told me, well, everything after 1990 is just really old, so it all just counts as really old. And like, I don't see what the difference is here, and it's about the stories, and it's like, I don't, unless you can prove to me why this is important, the age of it isn't really significant because for them everything, you know, 10 years before they were born is old. Right? Yeah, fascinating. Actually, Vancouver, uh, Tam has mentioned this, uh, Vancouver's one of the most progressive jurisdictions in North America in recognizing contemporary architecture. Anything older than 20 years old can be protected. Um, that would have to be exceptional, but it, it, we, the, the city designated the Evergreen Building by Arthur Erickson that was opened in 1980. Um, the, so it, it is a progressive framework. Uh, National Historic Sites it varies, you know, but in the United States it's 35 years before you can get on the National Register. Some jurisdictions are 50 years. It's a little bit artificial. Um, I, I feel you know, you need some time to be able to assess value, and obviously many of these things are comparative. I remember when Robson Square opened and everybody said, oh, it should just be designated. Uh, it's such a masterwork, and it's like, well, wait a minute, you're gonna use the heritage tool to protect a brand new building, so it'll never change. Not sure, you know? So we do need time, no question, yeah. But it's also a question of significance. I mean, I think there's maybe some other gray area that maybe it doesn't become heritage, right? I mean, you know, but it's still considered significant because, you know, the things left over from the Olympics, right? They, that was a very significant moment in Vancouver, or even something from Expo 86, there was a significant moment. And so in 87, it was significant, but it wasn't heritage, right? So there has to be some way of recognizing, and I'm hoping that this framework allows us to assess and go, wow, this hits on so many cylinders that even though it may not be considered heritage for 20 years, it's significant enough that we should keep it around even if we're allowed it to change or whatever we do and commemorate it. Thank you. My question is for Joanna. Um, we've heard from multiple people the importance of public engagement and education as a part of this process. And I'm just curious how you approach that at UBC when such uh, a large proportion of residents of UBC are transient, essentially, with the students. Yeah, that's a really um, good point. It's, it's kind of a, a microcosm and a sped up version of a, of a city. There's uh, sort of four-year cycles of, of people coming and going. Um, although, uh, UBC has evolved um, quite a bit in terms of, um, you know, its its development of, of neighborhoods, and so there is quite a, a large population of permanent residents um, as well as, um, you know, faculty and staff who are there uh, for longer periods. But, um, you know, it, it is um, we, I think, you know, we're, we are challenged in in terms of how uh, aware our community is of of the framework. Um, and so it's, you know, it's uh, part of implementing each project is trying to uh, bring those values um, to, the, to the forefront, um, as I mentioned, uh, because it, 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 it does permeate the whole campus plan, so it, it affects how we um, deal with public realm, how we deal with new architecture, uh, how we deal with cultural projects and animation projects, um, and where it does affect uh, heritage resources. Uh, for instance, now we are um, in, involved with um, our athletics um, uh, department on an athletics strategy, 20-year athletic strategy that's that's contemplating the future of uh, War Memorial Gym and, and Thunderbird Stadium uh, to very um, you know culturally significant uh, resources on the campus, and and so those projects uh, went through uh, a very extensive consultative process. Um, and heritage was one of many issues that was discussed um, and you know it really um, that the framework helps us to to identify it as an important resource and and it, it isn't it isn't an end 
point. Um, it's uh, it's a starting point, and so you know uh, through the process we had a, a more detailed study done of both facilities, a statement of significance um, that really went into detail on how important those those resources were, and and so um, we will be taking that forward into. Um, uh, the next stage of, of planning and, and really considering um, the various competing uh, interests in, in how we deal with those, those buildings. So, I um, hope that answered your question. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm Eric Fiss, I'm an architect and a planner, so I do share a love of heritage buildings, historic districts, quirky artifacts of the past, uh, and my question, and I do want to preface it a little bit, uh, is really going to ask what you define as heritage. And I say that because I really want to know what the agenda of, of this body of work. It's a very important body of work. It's, it's very important to have this information out there. And I'm very encouraged what Tan has said about it being an armature, and it's only the first layer of information. So I'm really concerned that it sort of stops and it's frozen, because if it's free, frozen at this level, it becomes a heritage in action plan. It becomes something that will just be used for protectionism, conservation of the past, and not thinking about heritage the way I think I was reading uh, Heritage Canada Looks at Heritage Framework, which had a lot of action words about development, building, the future. And so I challenge you to say, if you think heritage is, is not just about historic past, but it's about building the present for the future, to me, that's heritage. It's what we're creating for the future now. And so, certainly you want to build on the past, but you have to think about the future. I, I completely agree. I think that's where, I think that this will help do that. And, um, you know, I think the, the questions about, uh, you know, this being aspirational, the thematic framework, it actually is inspirational too. I think that's the one piece that, what this does is just help us under, understand the past. You know, the young people can look just like buildings they're just old, all old buildings. But when people take the time, or, or through our commemoration, through our the way our our society lives in space, we can help tell these stories of the past that have importance. It doesn't mean it has to be through that building being there. It could be through how that space is used, or you know, it could be plaques, it could be banners, it could be um, you know events sponsored by a, a business as a, association. Um, but at the same time, it could and it should still be buildings. And I think the definition of what heritage is, that's one thing also to clarify, is that from the city's point of view, when we talk about our heritage conservation program, and we talk about, um, through this work in the Heritage Action Plan, we'll be renewing our conservation program, developing a heritage strategy, strategy to help inform uh, the, the way that we, we might encourage and support heritage in the next period of time. Um, some of that will be limited to the tools we have for heritage, in the Vancouver Charter, which does speak to real property, is a, is a property, it's a space, and that's where the best ways to celebrate or to honor the themes in this thematic framework might not be through the heritage tools in our in our toolkit. It might be through our 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 public programming that we have that we support through our cultural services department, or it might be through um, through our zoning tools that we might use to help manage neighborhood character. It's not through the heritage tools of heritage conservation districts or um, heritage vitalization agreements and designation in the heritage register. It, it's other things. So I think that's one piece of this, is that there's a whole bunch of ways that we can use this information. It's not just through heritage with a capital H, which might be through our heritage conservation tools. It might be through neighborhood planning, through architecture, through urban design, all these things. So that's what I, I hope we can talk about and describe it and, and use it for. Uh, the mistake is thinking you can measure heritage. And it's not like you can set up some kind of planning formula where you get 2.3 heritage units per acre. And, you know, it just, it just doesn't work that way. And I, more and more, and, and, and I get a little bit cranky about this as I get older, is um, that heritage does not exist in isolation as part of culture. So I don't know why we just don't talk about culture frankly. Um, and then the heritage part of that can be buildings, and it can be people, and it can be events, and it can be all kinds of things. Um, the peer review committee we had for the thematic framework really challenged us in the very first meeting, and not only did we get beat up on many things, but um, 
we were challenged to stop thinking of Vancouver as ending at a certain date and challenged to stop thinking about Vancouver as stopping at the borders of Vancouver and to think more holistically about what Vancouver meant to the region and the country and to stop ignoring UBC because it was not the jurisdiction of the city because the impact was there. Um, to uh, think more deeply about the Aboriginal part of the development of the city, to think about the land forms, uh, the geography, the climate, topography, uh, to be ultimately inclusive of more than just the house, the school, the church, the bank. And, and so that's where I think that work is a starting point. Um, to weave it into the cultural fabric of the city. There's many categories of sites and many themes that we talked about that relate to human activity that didn't produce pretty buildings. Um, that's a challenge. There's virtually nothing left of historic First Nations architecture. That's a challenge. So you have to find other tools to get at that. So that's why I see it more broadly as cultural rather than just heritage. I, I'm really resisting that term a lot these days, yeah. Um, and, and Eric, you and I are colleagues and we have lunch together often, so this answer is not gonna surprise you. I, um, when I was at the city of Victoria, I started saying I don't want to talk about heritage anymore. I uh, deliberately in the OCP did not silo heritage. Heritage is part of a chapter on placemaking. And placemaking is focused on now, um, with an eye to the past and an eye to the future. So we are um, working with place right now, um, making architecture and every other aspect of um, our places that we want to have around in the future. And what we already have isn't the starting point. What we're doing is making the best possible places that we can right now and layering it on onto all the all the other layers of, of time. A bit of an abstract answer, but the point is that as Don said right at the end there, I resist talking about heritage. What I think about all the time is placemaking. So how does urban design, heritage and arts and culture in the public realm all all come together? And I, I see it as cultural resource management. And I'm trying to call myself that, but it's too wordy. You know, cultural resource management consultant. Uh, but I, it, it, really, the, the more that we have talked about heritage traditionally, it only gets applied to buildings. And so we were really thinking more broadly in the thematic framework. Um, uh, we integrated public art. As Helen mentioned the Stan Douglas mural. It's mentioned in the thematic framework and as is the event it commemorates, right? Like so those are those are aspects of events that propel our understanding of the city and our identity that need to be recognized. And so it's it's much broader than just identifying a site. And I think that's what when you really get into that thematic framework approach, you really be that's when the connections happen. And that's what I think is really crucial about that thing. I know there's a question out there, but I want to just ask, extending on this question, right, about, you know, that we're, we, you know, I think we're quite in agreement about the placemaking that we this forward, and, you know, except for Joanne, there's a constituency that's difficult to deal with out there. Um, it's large, and it has a lot of pains, you know, and so I think that for the city's point of view, I mean, how personally, you know, you think, because we have to make a shift, right? People are going to have to make a shift. Right now, I ask somebody on the street, they'll say, Heritage, right? Because for whatever reason, it's got pinholes and things, and that's the way they understand it. And this is a far more sophisticated way to understand things. And even though you may be able to point somebody to say, "We'll support you with cultural services rather than heritage," there is going to be a shift, I think, in, in the heritage and the heritage community out there, understanding of heritage. Um, I guess I see it as more of a more of a broadening. So we'll still have our heritage tools. We'll still be able to look at that something and say, "Hey, that's heritage. We should work together and." designate that building and make an HRA, uh, a heritage revitalization agreement, um, to help renew it for the future. 
but keep it there. Um, you know, that building could be 20 years old. So we've got these tools to be able to do that. Um, but the broadening is where we can then, um, where there are places that either the, the resource isn't there, there's nothing physical, but it's an intangible heritage that is more about the use and the people and the, um, the activities, but there's other tools we have to use that, and this can just help give some strength and some foundation to why we should do that. Why should we give grants to certain activities, or why should we support um, whatever uses in zoning to make that happen into the future in certain areas, whatever that may be, like corner store, for example. Um, because it's been there, we'll be able to point back why that started and how that happened and why that corner store is actually part of our so past. Put more corner stores in? Yes, it could. You know, I think that's part of Vancouver's past. It's, it's the, there were corner stores in all neighborhoods for reasons, because that's how people bought their goods. It was followed, a, you know, the traditional patterns of, of movement for people at the time, and they, they located in all different places, and there was housing in the back. You know, we should allow people to possibly build a new corner store with housing attached to it in neighborhoods. I think that makes sense. And I think there's a foundation for allowing that by looking back at our sort of frame, um, our, our themes and our framework. Um, so, that, you know, those are the kinds of things where I guess it's a broadening that can help us understand um, how how things were and why they were and how that can continue or should continue, um, you know, as opposed to shifting and we can't do it that way anymore. I think it's more let's do more things in different ways. Um, I'd like to just keep pushing the conversation beyond buildings, if we could. Um, and I'm really interested in the idea of events and rituals that are tied to place. Um, I live in East Van, um, and I'm going to direct this to to Dawn to start with, and maybe others have opinions. But um, the Pacific National Exhibition and the Hastings Race Course um, are two um, examples that I think are very entrenched um, in the neighborhood and there's obviously conflicting opinions on uh, the future of both of those things. Um, where does that fall in this conversation and what's your opinion on, on those specific items? Um, the, I did my architecture thesis on the PNE. Um, I'm a, um, I'm a Gordon Bred Vancouverite, and I love the PNE, and, and uh, uh, it's the continuous fair that's been occurring since 1908. I mean, it, what's more historic in our city? I always thought, I mean, of course the PNE's in there, certain buildings are listed on the register, and we are recommending the Pacific Coliseum and the Agrodome for the register. Uh, probably won't be popular choices, but I think there's a lot of historical reasons why you would recognize them. Um, the bigger, broader issue for me is that just because something is historic doesn't mean it can't evolve. Uh, I always thought there was an incredible potential to use the PNE as as uh, a year-round cultural fair, not just an agricultural fair, and, and that it needed to evolve from its its origins. But as a place, it's so historic and so important to the east side, to people from the east side, um, I, I think that's recognized. And I, where it goes in the future, don't know. I think it will evolve, though. And it's big enough and, and, and a big enough site and a robust enough site to take some evolution. I don't think that's a problem. Um, I was one of the people that fought very hard n to not have the food building torn down. I thought that was a mistake, and I still think it's a mistake. Um, it was a blunder in terms of our understanding of how that site should work. Uh, and it was, uh, to me, an important part of an ensemble of buildings, and we lost one quarter of that ensemble with the loss of that building. So I, I think we can accommodate a lot of other uses um, by, you know, do we need acres of asphalt there? Do we need parking lots all over the place? Do, you know, can we can we green it up? Sure, we can absolutely. And I, I think uh, if we can do that, we can continue to have the equivalent of that fair, uh, but expand the use of that site. I don't see a conflict personally. No conflict. I, I mean, I can't. I guess I, I speak to um, again that this is as Dawn's mentioned the, the historic uh, factors that are there um, as a as a place for for the PNE as open space, but but you know, are there other uses that we could imagine? Um, yes, of course, but I don't. You know, I, there's there's been planning programs for for that area. I've not been part of them, um, but I think understanding 
the, the value of the place is important no matter where it is. So that's one of the, the pieces of sort of the historic context statement and, and the thematic framework is to help do that. What we do with it, that's discussions that need to evolve and happen and include other, other people, broad neighborhood discussions, other groups in the city, um, and it's all about trade-offs. And I think that's one of the conversations with you know, any of these things that we might do, there's there's going to be trade-offs, and that's part of, of heritage and going forward and evolving is that there's going to be, um, there's, there there usually has to be willing partners to make things happen, whether it's the property owner. Um, we've got tools where we use zoning, and sometimes the property owners aren't willing, um, but it's the way that the neighborhood has been established, and our, our, we're, as a city, helping manage its change over time. Um, conversations about whether we should be doing that and something else, that takes things to another, that's another conversation to have that might end up in changes to our plans. So um, that's why it's not just a in one place in time. Um, and many people have different opinions. I mean, I think that's where we, through some of the work that we've been doing through the Heritage Action Plan, we've talked very briefly about the Character Home Zoning Review. There's very diverse opinions about what we should be doing with um, certain types of buildings. and. You know, it's, it's going to be a, a, a eventually some of these decisions become um, a decision for council to to make uh, based on all of the different inputs that they'll be hearing and weighing off the trade-offs about what we should do. So, you know, that's that's the challenge we have. I, um, if I may, just add um, an example from UBC um, that um, sort of speaks to this idea of of landscape and not just building um, and and. Uh, an evolution of, of space, uh, but trying to still keep um, the, the culture and the social uses um, of its essence. Um, it, it's a space in the center of campus called Library Garden, and uh, it's um, it it, uh, it really was um, designed as as the center kind of living room of campus. It's right in front of the main library, um, and over time it evolved. Um, it, it became. Um, the site of a, of a submerged building, Sedgwick Library, um, and the, the landscape itself was sort of separated from the rest of, of the main mall, um, and uh, just, uh, you know, it, 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 it sort of fell into a bit of a, you know, it wasn't used as, as much as it, it had been in the past. It was a really social space, uh, had a lot of um, festivals, uh, informal gatherings of students, um, and uh, currently, it's it's going through a revitalization um, to um, to really restore its importance as a as a central space on campus. Um, in addition, it's it's become the site of of, a, of another building um, uh, that's going to be the uh, Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center, um, a sort of a very small uh, pavilion space that's going to be connected to uh, Sedgwick Library, um, and it, it's it's really. Uh, um, a good example of taking the themes um, that we have uh, and, and layering um, the number of themes and trying to um, um, make the space meaningful uh, for, for contemporary times um, and to, to really connect uh, the space to the rest of the campus um, and introduce new uses that um, bring it new meaning. So. I, I did hear mention of, of you know, character houses and our team. So much of Vancouver heritage is based around houses and then extrapolated to neighborhoods, right? I mean, it's, and then because housing is so much of it, I'm very surprised that I haven't heard a single question about, you know, <laughs> about houses or how this might influence these kind of neighborhoods and how that might work, right? How, what's a lot of, so much discussion in Vancouver is around RT neighborhoods and what do we do and, you know, our first heritage conservation area was actually like houses, it wasn't anything else. And we, we have industrial and other things to protect that are easier, but, Character is, is every uh, the uh, housing is everywhere, right? And and it's it's a big one. And I just wonder if it affects a lot of people. And certainly that's where people, if you ask them heritage, that's where they're going to point their finger. Uh, yes, and I, I think we should just be, you know in in response to that, our first heritage conservation area was a residential neighborhood, cultural landscape, um, not just the homes, uh, but also we have um, the neighborhoods of Gastown and Chinatown, the two historic districts in essence, function like heritage conservation areas. So, you know, we just need to acknowledge that those probably would have been the first if we had had the tool at the time. Um, so the, the fact that it's houses isn't just because they're the most important, it just happened to be the way the tools um, were available, um, and that that was identified as something for us to, to work on through the action plan. Um, the, the question around that, and I think that's where one thing also, when we look at the whole city, 
Um, we have, uh, and, and we have to look at what we have in the register. Don had mentioned there's about 2,200 sites on our register right now. I think there are about 90,000 buildings in the city. So it's a very small portion of sites um, that are actually on our register. And uh, then when we look further at those that are designated or protected in some way, so through a heritage revitalization agreement that's on title, it's just over 500. So of all of the buildings in the city that are actually protected, there are just over 500, plus those that are in um, the New Heritage Conservation Area, of which are about, uh, you know, there's 600 buildings in that are approximately in that area. About half of them are protected heritage property. Doesn't mean they can't be changed, but they're listed. Um, so that's a very, very small amount of actual buildings. You know, we do, of course, have um, have zoning where we uh, have the structure to protect the character. But again, I think in our RT districts, it's, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact numbers, but about 5,000 buildings. So, you know, it's not that we've got grand swaths of the city that we're like frozen and we're protecting. And I think that's the big conversation that's come out of our, our character homework is, um, you know, the, the, there was a strong interest in retention of neighborhood in areas where there's a lot of character. There's still a lot of buildings. Yes, they're old. Not everyone sees that period of time as being what's should, we should be dealing with, but they're there and there are people that value them. Um, the other voice in that was that we need to do something more with our low density housing areas. Why aren't we allowing other forms of housing more dense forms? Very valid question. And that's something that will, you know, for those that are keeners can go find a report on um, the, the council's agenda for Tuesday that is going to start addressing some of the, uh, the or begin a process to look at the questions around that. Um, how does the thematic framework relate to this? Well understanding how our neighborhoods evolved, um, understanding uh, what, what the, why the buildings were built the way they, way, the way they were. Um, through the, the rest of the action plan and some of the work that Don is also, you know, after we get through the launch of this um, context statement and thematic framework, we will have a heritage strategy. Don's got other reports that, that he's drafted for us that recommend possible heritage conservation areas, others that we might consider. Um, through community dialogue, it's not completely inconceivable that we might have um, interest in having a heritage conservation area of buildings built in the 60s. You know, there's a very, say, distinctive cluster of them somewhere. Well, that's, that, that could totally happen. I mean, that could happen, where, but, but that's, again, where we need willing partners. Will those homeowners be interested in a heritage conservation area? Is it something where the, the community around it wants it, and the particular owner right there, that moment, isn't interested, but we want to move forward anyway? Um, you know, all of these things will be uh, future discussions, community debates, um, but I think with a new set of themes, we'll at least be able to understand what's there now and, and have that as part of the discussion. Do any concerns about the Canby Street corridor? Um, but this is a perfect example of when Javier was asking about how we would use themes to work in neighborhoods. When you have a set of themes, and Don did this work um, for me in Victoria. You have citywide themes and then you use them at the neighborhood level to write a statement of significance, which sounds like a dry technical thing, which it is in a way, but what that gives you is you take the themes, you assess what's important in the neighborhood as far as values go, and very importantly, you identify what features in the neighborhood are essential to keep that look at the neighborhood overall as a cultural landscape. In Victoria, that, of course, it included buildings, and of course, it included streetscapes. It also included view corridors, every aspect of looking at a neighborhood comprehensively. And that is exactly the kind of work that Joanna's been doing at UBC. So um, I think our, our, our question, and I guess I'll wear a Heritage Vancouver hat, for a second, is in rolling out the community planning. I think we are why, and I think where we are challenged, all of us are challenged, um, you know, people that live in the city, people that work uh, and, and live in these neighborhoods, is at the pace that, that the city is evolving, um, and then the potential scope of change and the demands to address housing changes, um, impacts on people that can't afford to buy things because the stores are gone, those, like, those sorts of types of things. Um, you know, how do we elevate this conversation to uh, about bringing forward these themes as we're under such pressure to build more housing, to protect things? So th that's where it's going to be hard, and and we won't have the time. Um, unfortunately, I just I don't personally see how we'll be doing 
small-scale neighborhood plans at this stage with these, the, the, the things are, you know,